Okay, everybody, welcome to session 3.2. You might hear some kids milling around in the background. Try not to let them distract you, and I'll do the same thing. This is all about typography. Um, I'm bringing back these two documents. Remember I showed you th these documents on the second day of class? Um, what you see on the left is what's normally produced in an academic setting like a university, and what you see on the right is what the rest of the world does. Um, I realize that part of my job in this class is to get you to stop doing the academic formatting and start using a professional formatting. But I want you to notice something. This is re these two documents are really simple. There are no graphic elements. There's, there's just type. And so what's really interesting when you look at the two, the one on the left looks like the kind of thing you only read in, in, at college, whereas what's on the right looks like the kind of thing you might read in a book, in a newspaper, in a magazine. It looks much more like the stuff you read everywhere else. That tells you a lot. But what's more interesting is that the differences between these two documents all boil down to typography. <clears throat> typography is just how letters appear on the page. And there's a lot to that. I mean, that kind of oversimplifies. but. But this is all down to the way the letters appear on the page, and that's it. And there are really simple rules you can use that make this dr very dramatic difference in the way something looks. We're going to talk about fonts today. We're going to talk about body text and then the idea of using styles in a word processing application. All right, so let's start off with fonts. Um, there's a really great history of typography that I've linked to in the video in the description below this video. I encourage you to go take a look at that um, that video. It's only about five minutes long. It's animated and fun. And it'll teach you sort of the history of typography. I think it's interesting. It's valuable information. It helps you kind of know why things work the way they do. One of the things that the video will tell you is the difference between a serif and sans serif font. Um, a serif font is a font that has serifs. And those little dangly things at the ends of letters, those are serifs. And a sans serif font, sans is the is the the French word sans means without and so these are letters that don't have serifs. Um, what you need to know or what's important for you to know for our class is that as a general rule serif fonts are better for body text and sans serif fonts are better for headings. <clears throat> now there are a lot of reasons for this and there have actually been readability studies done to show that in printed material sans or sorry serif fonts work better for, for reading that's why almost every book you open is uses a, a serif font for the body text. But sans serif fonts work great for headings because they're distinctive and clear, and it also is a nice way to distinguish headings from the body text. Let me kind of illustrate. On the left, you've got a serif font for the body text, and on the right, a sans serif font. Um, in print, you're going to see a lot more of the stuff that looks like what's on the left. Um, now, if you look at the right and say, that looks totally normal to me, it probably has mostly to do with the fact that you might read a lot on the internet. Um, web browsers, web pages usually use serif, sans serif fonts for body text. They are they appear better on a screen. That has to do with the way it picks, the the screen uses pixels to create um, images and text. And so there's there's actually sort of a general recommendation that on websites you use a sans serif font, but on print you use a serif font. And they actually do appear differently based on the difference between screen technology and printing technology. I'm going to add a heading in both of these. On the left, you see I've done a heading that has a sans serif font. And you'll notice it has the effect of making it a little more distinctive and separate from the rest of the text. On the right, I used a, a serif font with the sans serif body text. And what you may notice is on the left, it looks good. In fact, it looks like things you read all over the place. But on the right, it, it hopefully it feels weird to you or doesn't look quite right. And that's because we've inverted it. And so it looks weird. It's different than what you normally read. Now, if you're looking at the thing on the right that I'm telling you looks weird and you think that doesn't look weird to me at all, well, that's fine. But you still need to do it the other way. You need to use serif fonts for the body text and sans serif fonts for the for the headings. The purpose of that is that is that it's a it's a prominent convention and it bothers other people. Even if it doesn't bother you, it bothers other people. Whereas you're not going to meet anybody who does this professionally or knows anything about it that prefers a sans serif body and a serif heading font. So 
One other observation about fonts, though, that matters is that the font you choose is sort of like body language. If I'm having a conversation with you and I'm slouched over, or I'm not looking at you, or if I'm sitting really erect and stiff, or if I'm looking into your eyes fascinated, I'm, I'm conveying all kinds of information to you, even without saying anything. The, the font you choose and the documents you create is sort of like body language. It conveys stuff that has nothing to do with the words themselves. Uh, all three of these uh, text boxes I've put up here on this slide have the exact same text, but they look very differently from each other. The, the first one uses Times New Roman, and it conveys the idea that you just don't care. And the, and the reason it conveys that idea is because Times New Roman is a default font. It's just, it's the one that Word uses. It's what, um, it's, it's what you see everybody else using. Uh, it's what professors have required from time, for, ever since computers were invented. And uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of a lazy font. And you can be more deliberate and choose a font that requires more attention to detail. Um, so forget Times New Roman. In fact, please don't use it. Uh, I don't think it's the best font for the job anyway, but uh, it conveys a message that you don't really care. The, the middle sample uses a, a font I, li I like to use occasionally called Garamond. Uh, it's common on Mac computers. They're equivalently great looking fonts uh, on Windows computers. And you'll notice it just looks more refined. Like it looks more thoughtful. And the reason is because it conveys this idea that I care. It's a font you don't see all the time, but it's a font that looks nice and uh, it conveys uh, it, it, it conveys this idea that you've put thought into the appearance of your document. And then we come to the last one, Comic Sans. I've already picked on this font. It's totally inappropriate for almost every kind of communication, right? Except for lemonade stands like we talked about. And uh, if you use fonts that are inappropriate for the purpose, it's you don't convey the fact that you don't care but you convey the idea that you don't know what you're doing. Um, when you are sort of using just whatever font you think looks neat, um, rather than being deliberate about the purpose of your font, you're conveying a bizarre body language. You're, you're conveying that you're out of place and you don't want to do that either. And so again, if you look at these three and you think, I don't care about any of those, well, th that's fine, but other people do care and that's why you need to be attentive to the way these things look. So just as a, a general advice, use for every document, you should choose two simple readable fonts. You use one for headings, generally that should always be a sans serif font, and you use one for body text, and generally that should be a serif font. Don't go crazy and embed five fonts in your document. Just go with two, one for headings and one for body text. If you're not sure what font to use, go look at practicaltypography.com for suggestions. You've already read that or, or will read that before class. Um, in fact, I, if you've got the time, I encourage you to read that whole website top to bottom. It's brilliantly done, full of great advice for mortals when it comes to typography. Okay, another variable of font si fonts is the size of the font. You all are familiar with how font sizes work. They're measured in points. And here you can see the difference between a 12 point font and a 72 point font. But what most people don't know is that font, the font size is not measured by the size of the letters. Um, it's actually measured by the size of the M. We talked about M and N dashes and how the, the name M comes from the blocks that, typog that uh, printing presses used to use for each letter. The height of a block is the M of the, f of the font. And the, uh, um, and so the way that works is you'll notice that here the M of this font is actually taller than the letter itself. This explains why different fonts appear to be different sizes even if you use the same point size. So you can have a font that's a 12 point, you can have another font that's a 12 point, but they look different in size. It's because the, 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 the person who created the font decided to use up more or less of the M for each letter. And so th this is why you can't always assume that 12 point letters are the same for every font. The M is the same size for all those fonts. But the but the person who designed the font used a different amount of space within the M for each letter. 
um, and, and so, but what you can be, what is consistent is the size of the M. And so the size of the M will always be consistent. And the, the convention now, the standard now, is that a 72 point M is going to be one inch tall. Um, so each point is equivalent to one seventy second of an inch. Now, why does font size matter? Why am I giving you this arcane description of font size? Well, as a general rule, in most printed documents, you want to use something that's roughly the size of an 11-point Times New Roman font. Now, I told you not to use Times New Roman, but the size of 11-point Times New Roman is about right. And so for most of the body text that you're going to write, I encourage you to start with a default of an 11-point font. 12 points in Times New Roman is too big. And so if you're not sure if you've got the size right, pull up a 12-point versus an 11-point Times New Roman and compare them and that'll give you some idea. But as a general rule, you can start off with an 11 point font and it generally looks good. You know, don't go below nine, don't, don't, certainly don't go above 12, but, but uh, 11 points is usually the best place to start. If it seems too big still 11 points, you can go to 10, but, but that's the idea, start off with a default 11 point font. <clears throat> now, fonts also have a weight. Most people just think of this as the difference between a normal font and a bold font. But the reality is some very well-designed fonts actually have a, a, an array of weights available. One of the fonts that I use, in fact I use this in all my slides, is a font called Avenir Next. And what's cool about Avenir Next is that it has six different weights. Everything from ultralight, which you'll notice I use in my titles, all the way up to heavy. I don't actually use heavy very often when I do bolded font in, uh, in uh, my slides. It's usually either bold or demi-bold. but but you get the idea that fonts have different weight. Um, there's also, fonts also have different style. The dominant difference in style is between normal and italic. You can also have condensed, which is another style of font where the letters are really close together and the letters are skinnier too. But uh, the only style thing I need you to, to know and worry about is italics. Now, why, why worry about it? Because there are some rules you, need to, you should follow when it comes to the weight and style of the fonts that you use. First of all, never put more than a few words in bold or italics. It weakens the impact and tires your readers. I did that here, and th because I put the whole thing in bold, it's like I didn't bold any of it. But what's worse, it feels like I'm shouting at you, right? Because I'm using bold the whole time, and that's a, that's a tiring effect for readers, and it actually reduces the impact. You're better off just picking the one or few words that you need to bold or italicize and, and instead of doing the whole thing. Never combine both bold and italics at once. It uh, it, it's, it it also sort of evokes the feeling of shouting, and and uh, quite frankly, it doesn't look as good. So use either italics or bolding for emphasis, and use them consistently. Never underline. Um, underlining is an outdated style that was necessary on typewriters because typewriters couldn't. The way typewriters are built is they didn't have regular bold you know and italicized versions of letters they just have one version of letters and so the way they would emphasize letters is with an underlining ability that typewriters had um, that's unnecessary it's it's never been the best way to communicate emphasis within a sentence uh, because we have computers we don't need it anymore so throw away underlining as a as a way to emphasize in fact um, it's 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 an outdated style that uh, is not only not necessary, but it just doesn't work as well or look as good as it italicizing or bolding. And of course, never use all three at once. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about body text. So that's all been about font. That's all been about individual letters, sort of how they're designed, how, how they look, and how to use them. Now we're going to talk about the way words combine on a page. Um, one of the ways that words combine on a page is with line spacing. Uh, on the left, I've got single space. On the right, I've got double space. On the left, it looks too tight. On the right, it's way too loose. In the middle, we've got it just right, and that's with a setting in your word processor called multiple. So what you can do is you can change the setting so that you're not doing single or double spacing, but you're doing it as a multiple of the font point size that you're using. And so here I've got a multiple of 1.2, which means that the line height is 20% larger than the M height of the font. And what that does is that adds a little bit of extra space, just sort of nudges in some extra space between lines that makes it dramatically more readable. In fact, that's the default I'd recommend. 
is when you're setting the spacing line spacing in your documents use the multiple setting and set it to 1.2 now if you're like professor miller i have no idea how to do this in word practicaltypography.com gives you instructions for microsoft word it tells you pretty much how to do everything and also if you use apple pages on your mac same thing for all of these things we're talking about, you can go to that website and it gives you instructions on how to do that for each one of, of these guidelines. Okay, next, line spacing is the space between lines. Paragraph spacing is the deliberate space you put between paragraphs. Really, there are actually two acceptable methods of visually distinguishing paragraphs. The first one is to use a first line indent. And so you can see on the left-hand side, all of my paragraphs are indented on the first line. That's a way to sort of visually break the paragraphs apart. On the right-hand side, I use paragraph spacing between each paragraph, and that's also another effective way to do it. What you don't want to do is to use both at the same time. Now, um, actually, let's go through these rules in order. First, when you're doing this, either line indenting, first line indenting, or paragraph spacing, don't do it using the tab key, the space key, or the return keys. Like, don't add carriage returns. Don't use, don't add like six spaces to the beginning of sentence of paragraphs. Don't use the tab key to start off a paragraph. What this does is this sort of inserts invisible character garbage. Your your word processor sees invisible characters there that you don't see. And if you ever need to reformat, like let's say you let's say you're looking at it, and you go, you know what, I really don't like the indent. I'm going to go with the with paragraph spacing instead have to go through and delete all the tab characters or spaces to get that consistent. Uh, instead, you want to use the built-in formatting tools in Microsoft Word or Apple Pages or whatever your Google Docs or whatever you're using, where you can tell it to, to insert a first line indent or to insert a, a paragraph space between paragraphs. And it will just do that consistently. And if you need to make a change across the document, you can make that change in one fell swoop. It's a lot more powerful that way. Um, like I said, you need to use either first line indents or paragraph spacing, not both. If you add both, it makes the document look weird. Um, <clears throat> and also be sensitive to the size of these things. For example, don't make indents that are too large or too small, like you can see here. And also don't make paragraph spaces that are too large or too small. Here I made a really big paragraph space to show you how it just it looks like 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 the printer messed up. Okay, let's go on to line length. So, so we talked about the spacing between lines and the spacing between paragraphs. Now we're looking at the horizontal length of lines. Bringing my two sample documents back up again, one of the things that really makes the readability of academic formatted papers difficult to follow is the line length. What happens is that you get to the end of a line and you go back to the next to start the next one and if it's a long paragraph you get lost and the reason you get lost is because your eye has to track from from one end of the page all the way to the other and it's harder to follow the flow in paragraphs on the right hand side you see we made the margins a lot bigger which as a result made the line length shorter and what you'll notice is this looks like the kind of stuff you read in magazines and newspapers and books they, they, these things have shorter line lengths, and as a result, they're easier and more fluid for reading purposes. Um, when you do line length, just the, the general rule is to do 45 to 90 characters per line. Now, if you're like, I don't want to have to count the characters in every line, there are two quick shortcuts you can use. One, Microsoft Word does a character count, it has a character count feature. And with that turned on, you can just highlight a line of text and it will tell you how many characters are in the line. And that's pretty cool. But if you don't want to do that or can't do that, you can always just type out the alphabet and each line should contain between two to three alphabets. So not, not fewer than two alphabets and not more than three should fit on a single line of text. Don't shorten lines so much, however, that you have deep ragged edges caused by long words. Um, because of the way left uh, alignment works. If you have a long word, it'll get bumped to the next line, which will mean the words above it have a big gap before they get to the end and then the next line starts. And so if this is happening, then what you need to do is turn on the hyphenation feature in your word processor. And those generally work pretty well and they'll hyphenate long words and it prevents you from getting deep ragged edges. Okay, um, another thing that happens in the way pages are formatted is a paragraph might 
uh, need to go on to the next page. Well, if just one line of a paragraph makes it onto the next page, that's called a widow. Um, the other version of this is where one line of a paragraph goes on one page and then the rest of the paragraph comes on the next page. That's called an orphan. Widows and orphans really interrupt reading. They make it so, for example, your topic sentence might get cut off from the rest of the paragraph. And the reader doesn't know necessarily if, if uh, this is meant to be a continuation of a paragraph or if it's a new paragraph, and it can interrupt the flow. Plus, visually, they just don't look very good. They look sloppy. And so the easiest way to deal with this is in every word processor, there's a feature called Widow and Orphan Control, and you just turn it on. Now, in a lot of doc in, a lot, in Word, I think in Microsoft Word, it's on by default. But just in case, if you're getting widows and orphans, then you need to make sure you turn that feature on. Um, again, if you don't know how to do this, I encourage you to check practicaltypography.com. It gives you the instructions. Okay, alignment is how the edges of the text look. And so on the left, I've got left alignment. And you'll notice the left-hand side is all straight, and the right-hand side is ragged. The middle version of this is right aligned, which means that all the lines line up on the right hand side and the left hand side is ragged. The last version on the on the on the right there is called full alignment or justified is another way to, is another name for that where you do straight lines on either side. Um, just some advice on this. For body text you should only use left alignment or full alignment. Um, the reason you don't ever use right alignment is because in English we read left to right and people need to be able to find the letters where they belong on the left hand side. Never center align more than a single line of text. If you have multiple lines of text you should not be using center alignment. And you might think, oh it looks pretty because it's symmetrical. Well it actually looks crappy because people can't find their way to the beginning of the next line because it's not where it belongs. And so make sure that if you're using center alignment, you only ever use it for at most one line of text. Um, because the second somebody has to go to a second line, the moment they have to go to a second line, they're not going to find where it belongs because the center justification means that lines are starting at different places on the page. And then finally, if you're using full alignment, um, I encourage you to turn on hyphenation again. That will help you avoid these rivers of blank space. If you look at the sample that I kept on the page, you'll notice that there are kind of some really wide spaces between words. Well, the, the software I'm using has to do that because I told it to use full alignment or justified alignment. And the problem is that it has to, the way it does this is by creating gaps between words. And if you, if you don't turn on hyphenation, really long words will lead to really big gaps between words. And so that's another reason to uh, use hyphenation. Okay, so all of these rules I've just given you are summarized here on this single slide. And in fact, for every document you write in this program for the rest of the time in your, in, in, during your degree and in your entire career, I encourage you to use these 10 rules as a baseline for all of the body text in your documents. Okay, use a sans serif font for body text. Use a, sorry, use a serif font for body text, a sans serif font for headings. Use two simple readable fonts and avoid Times New Roman. Use an 11 point font for body text in most documents. Use either bold or italics for emphasis, not both, and use them sparingly. Use either paragraph spacing or first line indents. Use lines that are 45 to 90 characters long. Use left or full alignment. Use widow and orphan control and use hyphenation. And you should be you should have some really pretty looking documents just with these 10 rules. Um, the last thing, and this is going to be very brief, uh, you know, one of the really cool things about computers is is that word processors have something called uh, style management. So you can define a, a, a style within a word processor, and then every time you have a particular kind of text, like body text, heading, like main heading, subheadings, whatever, you can have the document be consistent in how those all appear. If you've ever looked up in Microsoft Word in the ribbon and seen this and goes and just thought, oh, that's nice, they've done some preset things for me, but you don't know how these work, you need to learn how these work because you're going to be writing multi-page documents in this program and in your career, and to make these documents look good, you're going to have to monkey around with them. You're going to have to make changes, and if you don't use styles, making change, making text, cha making sort of stylistic changes or font changes 
will take you hours. But if you use predefined styles, it will take you seconds. And there's a huge difference between those two. And so, so, so understanding these styles and the powerful word processing, word processing tool that they are is really important. And so if you don't know how to use styles, watch one of the two videos that I've linked in the description of my lecture, in the video description below this, this YouTube video. You can find the links to a, a, a Windows version and to a Mac version of Microsoft Word and how to use styles in Microsoft Word. Okay, I will see you all in class.